Hey companions, this is Lawrence and Tommy here. We are recording this on December 6th. It is a Wednesday and it is getting dark in London. How are you doing, Tommy? <laughs> I'm great. Yeah, really good. Thanks. How about you? Yeah, yeah, great. I mean, we're going to be talking about conversations in sci-fi. This is our kind of first big, awesome, original podcast series. Um, it was hosted by Brad Wright and he basically, you know, went through his roster of favorite people, I guess, in, in Stargate or anyone <laughs> we can get during lockdown uh, to chat. It was um, 10 episodes and we kind of ended that season or the series really with none other than the biggest of the Stargate stars, Richard Dean Anderson. It doesn't get any bigger than that. He is the big star. In fact, in the this episode, he talks about how on the, the poster when they were negotiating parts of Rick's contract, his name had to be the same font size as as the name of Stargate SG-1, like the name of the show. But because it didn't fit on the poster, <laughs> all they could get was Hard Dean Anders. Exactly, and, and Rick yeah. just went, that sounds pretty cool. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's definitely his new name, Hard Hard Dean Anders. Uh, you don't need the R-I-C or the O-N at the end. Um, yeah, no, it was it was funny. He he Brad, um, not in this episode, but when we've spoken, you know, in the past, it's like uh even though I'm one of the co-creators of Stargate SG one, you know, my name's sort of at the bottom and Richard Dean Anderson's name is at the very, very top, like above Stargate SG one. So so you kind of know where his importance is. Yeah. Um, this, this is the only video from Brad Wright's Conversations in Sci-Fi that we'll have on the YouTube channel because it's the only episode that's actually a video. The rest was just a pure audio podcast. But you can you can listen to the whole series at www.thecompanion.app on the website. Um, and there's some really, really great interviews there. It was actually the first time I really worked with Brad was producing that podcast. And uh, yeah, I worked very closely with him. Every every, every month we, we uh, turned out... A, what I think is a really good episode. And this is probably a great culmination of that. So if you like what you're about to see, then definitely go back and add those to your you know, podcasting app on your phone because they're well worth a listen. Yeah, yeah. So you can find them all on the Companion website, but you can also find them you know, on um, Apple Podcasts and Spotify, or if you use like one of the other um, apps, uh, you can find that there as well. And um, so I got a question for you. Mm. What was it like, working for a showrunner like brad or working with a showrunner like brad um could you have imagined that you know five years ago or 10 <laughs> years ago kind of thing yeah what's that like it it was very surreal sending him a call sheet <laughs> with, with <laughs> yeah. his name on it when he's the guy that would you know hire people to write call sheets and put other people's names on it <laughs> it, was, it was a very <laughs> weird thing um but it was it was really really cool and really really fun um and he would often have notes, but he'd be, um, you know, really receptive to, you know, feedback from me, which is really cool. So it was, it was a really, really fun process. It was, uh, it was honestly one of my highlights that the companion was working on this podcast series with Brad. And how did it feel, you know, reuniting Brad and Rick for the first time? And I think over a decade at that point, they, they hadn't, you know, been able to connect over the years. What was that kind of feeling like? Yeah, it was really strange because we'd interacted very, very briefly with Rick to get kind of a special cameo message for Stargate AI, which was a few months prior to this. Um, and then Brad was very, very keen of like, we've got to get Rick on the podcast. We've got to make it happen. And we we kind of did the stars aligned and we we made it work and made it happen. And that was probably the best part, which is why we had to make it a video. Uh, this episode is because we had to see those guys just reunite and chat again and the the thing that a lot of people really loved about um this podcast series conversations in sci-fi is that it isn't like a typical podcast where it's a straight interview it it very much feels like you're in a pub and on the table next to you is Brad Wright and one of his like close friends who happens to be someone like Amanda Tapping or Michael Shanks or yeah, yeah. or you know um a showrunner from uh uh, another show like the expanse and it's narain shankar and or in this case richard dean anderson and you're just kind of hearing them catch up and have a great conversation and it feels it feels very privileged it feels like you're a fly on the wall when you probably shouldn't be there but you are and it is it's quite it's quite fun and relaxed it's, it's a uh, really cool format yeah i think another thing at least from like a, a viewership standpoint you know zoom was like the height of sorry we were in the height of the pandemic and zoom was the only way we can kind of communicate it was so prevalent 
So you're kind of flying the wall comment not only resonates, it's like you literally were almost like listening in on a Zoom call, if you know what I mean, that you weren't necessarily supposed to be on. Um, that's what was so kind of cool, you know, about it as well. Um, it was kind of like the the only way, you know, people would be able to communicate then. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and and the the podcast actually we we haven't done it since because it's kind of turned into what's now Stargate Legacy, which um you may have seen last week on the YouTube channel. We had the very first episode of Stargate Legacy, which was the 25th anniversary special edition with Richard Dean Anderson as well. So if you haven't watched that yet, you can you can check that out on, on our YouTube channel. Um, I, I would also suggest you you uh, consider subscribing because we've got a lot more content and a lot more videos coming very, very soon. Yeah, I mean, you know, Legacy was sort of just originally talking about, you know, the 25th anniversary of the first episode, right? Children of the Gods. Um, but it kind of proved to be so popular. We've brought it back and, you know, we've now talked about a window of opportunity with the other writers, um, Joe and Paul, um, and then Stargate Legacy, uh, rising uh, Stargate Atlantis, you know, legacy with uh, Rob Cooper and David Hewlett, who played Rodney McKay. And um, so, yeah, you really do get a certain type of conversation that I think is not normal. It's not an interview. I'll tell you that <laughs> they they jump straight in and they jump straight into the deep end. <laughs> yeah. And if if I'm being completely honest with you, companion viewer, um, one of the reasons we we changed it from the conversations in sci-fi format to the Stargate Legacy one is so that we can bring people back a second time around. So so we had <laughs> David Hewlett um, on the uh, conversations in sci-fi before, and we kind of talked through his whole career. But this way we get to have him back to talk about Rising and we can have him back again, maybe to talk about the Shrine or the Tower of Rodney. So, so now we get these people back over and over and over again, just like you're seeing now with, with Rick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, this episode specifically... Uh, the conversation between Brad and Rick, uh, Brad revealed a part of his like next um, script or the script that he was writing for MGM. And it kind of moved or at least su heavily suggested uh, the relationship between Jack and Sam also kind of moving forward, you know, over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, and yeah. it was so funny uh, on Twitter. I remember after the episode, I saw a fan and she had this kind of, you know, wall or collectibles wall that, you know, a lot of us fans have. Um, and she framed a toothbrush <laughs> in her Jack, Sam and Stargate section. And so I think uh, if you if you listen to and watch this episode, you will understand why there is a toothbrush and maybe you would like to frame a toothbrush as well uh, in your collector's wall. Yeah. And if you want to... Um meet brad and rick in person they're actually both going to be at basingstoke comic-con uh may 10th and 12th so may 10th to 12th so um the companion's going to be there as well we can have some sort of presence there so definitely come and yeah hang we'll out definitely with us. be there yeah so so can't wait to see you there obviously we'll in fact you know what we'll meet brad for the first time in person very kind true. Of weird isn't it yeah yeah like we've spoken to him like a hundred times, like literally a hundred times, yeah, yeah, but always easily. through Zoom. So this will be the first time to see how tall he is, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And if you like conversations with uh, Brad Wright, um, the companion holiday special is actually coming up really, really soon. I think it's, well, it is December 16th, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific time, 2 p.m. Eastern time, 7 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Um, and we're going to talk about, you know, holiday specials in general and then lots of fun Stargate holiday segments. So it's going yeah, to be a really, we even really got a, event. you know, fun surprise uh, celebrity um, email, I guess, if you want to call it literally like 30 minutes ago or something yeah, in our yeah. inbox. So I haven't had actually had a chance to look at it yet, but um, apparently it's quite funny. And yeah, if um, you've watched many of our companion <laughs> videos and events before, you know that we like to sprinkle in a little surprise or two here and there. So you can definitely expect that for this one. Yeah. And this one in particular, if you're a member or if you're not a member and you've never really heard of us before, um, the companion holiday special is absolutely going to be free for the public. You don't have to be a member. Uh, we really just want to kind of help lift up the spirits and, um, you know, be merry and happy around the holidays and um, yeah, just do something really cool with the wider community. And so we're going to have a lot of other community elements from Stargate TikTokers and YouTubers and members and stuff, all kind of contributing and doing things. So actually, if you, you know, are a Stargate fan, but you haven't really been, you know, connecting with Stargate fans online, uh, this is like the perfect buffet for you to start sampling, you know, all, all types of uh, uh, 
Stargate communities, I guess, um, on the internet. Yeah, so block out a couple of hours on December 16th. Tell all your friends, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and hopefully we'll see you there. Yeah, cool. And in the meantime, enjoy Conversations in Sci-Fi, episode 10 with Richard Dean Anderson. Oh, hi, Rick. Hi, Brad. There you go. Oh, that's Brad. better. That, that feels like the that, old days. That's our sign. You know, that probably began out of nervousness when we met because I was trying to be cool. And so in my attempt to be cool, hey, I was, this was a long time ago. And, you know, you were Richie Dean Anderson. You were, you know, you were a major star. You still are a major star, but you know what I'm saying. And I was trying to be cool. So I went, oh, hi, Russ. Yeah, very casual, very thrown away. It became my it. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, and, uh, it's been a while. It's been a long time. No kidding. You said 11 and a half years? Something like that. I think so. I mean, that's how long ago. You you came to play in Stargate Universe a few times. Yes. And that was that the last was Stargate that happened. I, I was going to call this uh, a, a, a Brad and Rick talk at, on a trip down lack of memory lane. I thought that would be appropriate. Losing memory lane. I love it. <laughs> well, I, you know, people say I, I've done the occasional interview, or I'm sure you do conventions all the time. They don't no, I don't. But I, well, I don't when even. you could. I pre -COVID did. Pre-COVID you were, yeah. And people would ask, uh, you know, hey, do you remember this, this? And you would just, no. I don't no. really. <laughs> <laughs> In the fact, same way. If I was ever there with uh, one of our other um, Amanda friends, or Michael, yeah, mostly Amanda, I would. If I got asked the question, I always just immediately look to her. I said, "Don't ask me. I don't remember." Two minutes ago, ask her. She knows, and she does but, know. Yes, she does. She's doing you know, well. Amanda has become an amazing director. That's what I hear. Yeah, she came and did uh, as my last show, which was already coming up on almost three years ago. Travelers, you have you have to watch it if you haven't seen it. Say it again. Travelers. It's Travelers, okay. It's on Netflix. Okay. Oh, good. And, and Amanda directed a ton of them and ended up being in the third season, like our main director, Andy and Amanda and Will. You remember? I, you remember the people behind the camera? I know you do. Truly, I do. Yeah, I know. And no, no, she's really good. And of course, I made her be in the show as well. <clears throat> Eric McCormack was the was the uh, the lead, but it was fun. We had a great time. It was a great time. Good show. And <clears throat> we got to just do it ourselves. There was no, you know, evil studio breathing down our necks. Now, would, did it start out with Netflix? Yeah, it always was a Netflix show too, but we had a Canadian broadcaster, but they, uh, they overplayed their hand in season three and tried to basically renegotiate their license fee. And that ah. went, bye, see ya. Well, first the, the show died and then the effects came to save us, but it was not good. I mean, I was so mad because I'm, you know me, I'm a proud Canadian and I always tried to hire Canadians and you were never, you never objected to that. But <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a Canadian trying to make a show in Canada and, uh, and the Canadian network is the one that screwed us screwed us up, so it pissed me off. Were you vocal about that? Uh, not enough at the time because I was afraid. I, well, I was you're yeah. Canadian. You're too polite. You're too nice about things. That's true. That's true. Don't I, do uh, that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It's a flaw. It's a flaw it, it built in. But uh, it's you know it's got me some stuff too. I've done okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. I reflect on your success over the years and it's, it's quite awesome um, to look at as a, like, I don't know everything you've done, but I know that when we were together, you were so prolific and so hands-on. It was just wonderful. It was fun. I, you know what we did though? And all it, you and I both had this sense of keeping the, keeping people together and promoting from within and 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 we always did that that's that's what you know Andy started off as a as a uh, first, AD. first AD so did Martin 
and you know they became great directors. What's Martin? Where's Martin these days? Martin's uh, doing a lot of uh, stuff for Netflix. I think he's like the main director on a on a, a Netflix show that shoots on Vancouver Island. I don't. We haven't. We've kind of lost touch. I suck yeah. at keeping in touch with people. With people. I yeah exactly. So hi, I have to do a podcast <laughs> in order you to say I hello to people. <laughs> It's my only way. Yes, yeah, my only way. No, but I mean that's that was the fun of that was the fun of Stargate. We we had a this growing family and we cared about people becoming, you know, what they wanted to be. And and that's why, you know, so many people stuck around for so long. I think so, yeah. Well, because it was fun. It was. I know the only the only demand I made on set was that everybody have a good time, feel good. Uh, it's got to be positive. If you've got a problem, come to us, go to uh, Brad and let, air it out. Get it yeah. out. So nothing's festering. And it seemed to work out. That it way. did. And, and I quote you actually constantly uh, in every room I've been in since. And it's your acronym LTS because life's too short. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, you, I mean, you just occasionally, you know, if, if there was a, an actor that sounded like they might be a handful that somebody was talking oh. about. You might, you might just turn to me and say, LTS. <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, right. And that's, that's how to proceed, right? Well, I remember in the uh, MacGyver days, I would just confront the actor. I did that a couple of times and it didn't serve me well um, overall, but it took, usually took care of problems on the spot. I mean, if, yeah. if, couple actors that were acting like uh, their shit didn't stink or we owed them something bigger than they get a paycheck yeah. and uh, it just didn't fly with my sensibilities my minnesota upbringing so when was the last time you, you still I, I know you still see or talk to dan shade you, you probably haven't seen amanda since she was in a and at a convention with you have you heard from anybody uh no, not at all. Um, I've kind of correspond a little with Amanda, although lately she's been um, apparently very busy. No kidding. And, uh, unable to return my texts. And she's uh, producing directing now. Arguably that's the hardest job in the business because there's no off time. You're always there. You're not only yeah. directing when you're directing, you're directing when other people are directing. I mean, you were you were definitely there for for a, a, a chunk of it, but there was a time in the last couple of seasons of SG One in the beginning of Atlantis where we were doing both shows at once. Okay. Who knew that skiing down a hill at ninety miles per hour and crashing was going to be a bad idea? Seven times. Yeah. 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 Or trying to be a hockey player in my sixties uh, was going to be a problem. Yeah. But. Yeah. It has become, it's not dire, I'm not going to die or anything. It's, although I, I think someday I may. It's possible. I'll, yeah. You think? It's, it's possible. I'll lay odds. <laughs> it's, the only, it's the only contest that everybody wins, right? We all, we all end up with that ticket. Well, I hope, you, uh, I hope it works. I, I, I've, heard, I've heard people do that and it's been quite successful. You have. Yeah, but I've also, I mean, it depends on what the issue is. I mean, as long as you're curing the right thing. Yeah, well, my- The physio thing and- Oh yeah, yeah, all of that. In fact, um, I was in the pool this morning doing my therapy, but um, yeah, it's, it's just a hassle. I mean, it's such a drag because, you know, I'm what, what am I, 71, I guess? 70 something, I know that. I just turned and, 60. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, you're beautiful. You're so, <laughs> you're so beautiful. <laughs> My boy. <laughs> oh. Hey, you have, know. Have you I remember your bowling party for your 50th. You remember that? Yes, I do. That was fun. I, I still have one bowling pin from it that April wrote on it and I, I don't it. know why you would have taken more than one, but 
True. <laughs> it, it's it's probably yeah that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so so but film is in the family now. Do you mind do you mind talking a little bit about that? Oh, that's, that's exciting. Talk about are you kidding? I am so elated the way this girl has turned out. Um, We're talking about Wiley, your daughter. Wiley Quinn Anderson. Yeah, she's. Um, I I don't know where the where the energy came, but she's well. She's twenty three. You know, oh, kids. But she is. She went to um, college in uh, Emerson back in Boston, and uh, graduated with a degree in um, acting performance and had the sense enough to get a, a, a degree minor in, um, in education, in teaching. So she, during the pandemic, when it was like just kind of taking over, um, she was able to teach small groups of kids um, in isolation. Both of my yeah. kids teach high school, you know. Really? Yeah, oh, yeah that's they're both. Great. Yeah, they're they're both high school teachers. It's oh, uh, it, and it was their vocation from a very young age. It's something that they wanted to do. They're they're both wanting to be teachers from when they were little. Where did that notion come from? I knew I I know this. I know they had absolutely no desire to be in our business. Because do you remember when right. I, when we would have kids exactly? Remember we would have kids sometimes you know, as extras. And uh, I, I once during the Outer Limits, when my kids were very young, um, <clears throat> asked them to, um, come on, we'll go and you'll just, all you have to do is run with the other kids. All you have to do is run with the other kids. And they were wrapped around my legs, one each. So it was uh, <laughs> not gonna happen. Have, all you have to do is sit around and wait forever that's, and then run. That's true, that's true. That's they do not, both write though. They do both write. My youngest, Kayla, has written a novel. Bo both of them have written novels. Uh, I think Kayla's a little more serious about it, but... Uh, How old are they? Uh, 32 and 30. What? Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, my God. I know, I know. I, I thought know. you were well, like 16 and 18. You know, they oh. would be the they would be very young teachers at that stage. Tess, do you remember when I was trying to get the nudity out of the first episode, and we were all yeah. sitting in the room and editing, and and uh, and I had Tessa with me sitting on my knee, and I said, "So I have to take my daughter out of this scene. So maybe that's a clue as to my opinion on this." And uh, and they well, agreed to cut the nudity in half, but that's it. But still full frontal, right? Oh yeah. 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 Well, it, you know what? Uh, to its credit, the existence of that, um, I think it garnered some attention. True. Which might have helped down, you know, along the way. So Wiley is now, she's, uh, she left college and, well, before she left, she was uh, in like, like a few um, acting troops, one in improv. Uh, slash comedy troupe that's what which you she, she absolutely uh did that on her own because uh she i mean she's seen my antics but there's nothing structured about what i do and how i talk or write um but she got the spark and she took a chance and she just jumped in feet first and um was very successful at at uh, at what she was anything that she was taking on she acted in several uh one acts at uh at emerson but <clears throat> but then the last year she got into the film department fine that was kind of pushing her towards that a little bit because she when she was a kid uh, as soon as I knew she could show show interest, she was um, making little short films, editing on the computer, and I mean, just with an aptitude that knew how to do that. I mean, allowed because I don't, I don't have that unless somebody else is doing the moving around. There's a like a Mike yeah, Elliott. You have an innate awareness of what a good 
cut is. I used to get yeah, notes. but I don't know how to get. It. She had the technical um, prowess as well. But um, so anyway, she's done a bunch of those and then um, left and came out to California. She's been back to New York several times. But she started writing a um, a film finally. Right. Uh, I mean, she's written a play which is very successful in um, in uh, Boston. But then she wrote this uh, screenplay, and it started out just as a kind of a story, which developed into a full fledged stage directions and everything type uh, script, which she's in prep for right now. And um, I just am elated. In fact, if we kept talking like this, I would be misting up because oh, that's great. she has, she's finding, um, and I warned her about, you know, the, the problems that you'll face and the general, you know, nastiness of the business. But along the way, you're going to find people to help you. And um, I'm the first one. So always turn if you need. She doesn't turn to me at all. <laughs> that's <laughs> great, though. Yeah. It's great that she doesn't. I mean, it's that's what she, you want, right? Yeah, absolutely. She has left the nest and she's on her own. Um, I, the only, I finance this movie she's doing right now, but it's a very low budget. And um, I just want her to be freed up to, uh, to be the creative director on this. And, um, and it's working out. She's in prep. She's doing the whole thing, casting. She's just a gem, I'm telling you. That's fun. And you know, that's, that's the way, the, the, the way to get attention as a director, especially, but as a writer director, definitely uh, the way to, the way to, to get attention is to make your own stuff because that's yeah. the only path in. It's not like anybody's going to give a young person, like I get asked all the time when I'm making a show, like it happened with Stargate, people would say, Hey, can we try so-and-so? Would you, you know, they're a great up and coming director. And we would go, no, it's a, <laughs> Three million dollar episode television. It's we spend a hundred thousand dollars a day. If 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 your new client makes a mistake, we're screwed. We can't afford to risk that. We can only, and if we're going to risk anybody, it's going to be one of our own upcoming people yeah, exactly. who we know and love and trust, and we will not let them fail. And we had a bunch of those guys too, and girls. Yeah. yeah. No, did. that's a that's a that's a wonderful um, philosophy uh, policy to have, actually. It is, and and, uh, and so when we did Travelers, it was so nice. We brought a lot of people back uh, that I had worked with, and it was it was fun. It was fun to to see how people would go, and and in the interim between Stargate and my show, uh, had learned a whole bunch of stuff and and brought it to the table and said, uh, "How about this?" And I go, "Yeah, that that sounds amazing. Let's do that." I'm not really someone who will ever want to direct. Did you? You, did, you never, you never no. had that desire. No, I. I thought that would, for me, be a kind of a selfish, selfish indulgence, um, and uh, I didn't want to basically get in the way because the show ultimately, except for some nuances along the way, was pretty um solid every and that's not the word i'm looking for but it had a, a certain structure to it we were a well-oiled machine exactly and i yeah. didn't want to uh, educate myself uh, as a director um on a set that where people were making it work and i was probably a little i don't know maybe afraid of it a little bit I think that's I fair for me too. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, not being able to for well, one w as I once said to someone else, what is it about the credit executive producer that you find inadequate? I, you know, I mean, <laughs> if we wanted a shot, if we wanted to get a sequence of shots, we could say, "Hey, do this sequence of shots," and and the director would say, "Okay, okay," and the and the rest of it is just a ton of work, right? You yeah. know, yeah, that was but, the other. I forgot yeah. about the aspect about how much 
work it is and oh. to the prep and the you know, everything can I just I don't think I could have done it I used to uh, on, on travelers because uh, I was the uh, sole uh, showrunner creator uh, as opposed to sharing the the duties as we did through Stargate um, I would often go to the uh, the set really early. Like I go to work really early and then just drop by set to see how the set looked, if it was a fresh set. And Andy is always always there at least an hour before call, just to make sure, just to double check. So you know he's already working 14 hour days. Comes in an hour early just because that's Andy. Just gotta make sure. Just gotta yeah. that level of hard work is so I don't even know if I have it in me. That's Wiley, just what you described in Andy. She is so, and she's gotten this comment from everyone she's uh, met along the way during this uh, production. Um, she is so prepared. Just, uh, she got that from college. I, she just, from that point on, she had to be ready. She had to know everything. And I swear to God, she, Anyone I talk to just says, do you know your daughter's kind of prepared for this? And I said, well, rumor is it has it that, yeah. And, That's great though. Oh, it's so wonderful. It's a work ethic that um, I es espouse. Wait, is that the right word? Espouse, yeah, you, you, you believe in it. Uh, that's yeah. what that would mean, yeah, yeah. Didn't know what that Aspire meant. Aspire to would be another one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. But thing, uh, th she's so good. That's all. The bottom line is that she's not. I don't have to worry about her. That's so I good. do, of course. But of course, that's you dead. had your share of getting up at five o'clock in the morning uh, to to get for a, in the makeup for six to get on set for seven. Uh, you did that for oh, I don't know, a few hit shows. Too long, but over a couple of decades. Yeah, but that's then that's just getting up early, and you know, so what? I mean, you got to get up sometime. <laughs> we all just stay up. Long. Well, only twice, I think I did that, and that was an accident. Another thing that made it was different from my our schedule compared to you know an actor, a lead actor schedule is after rap, we started writing the next season, right? Oh, yeah. That was, uh, those, those are fun days, don't get me wrong. We rolled the dice. I, 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 said, I asked MGM every year to, I said, look, just pay, just put aside a little money, you know, uh, for development, just in case. Just, in, you know, let's roll the dice on getting picked up. And the only year that um, we didn't develop for next season, but don't forget, I remember sitting with you and Michael Greenberg it, in Norco, when John Symes called us in season one to say he was giving us another 44 episodes. I don't know if you remember that, but no, maybe we were four seasons. So that's, that, that's how that started. What, how does it work now these days in general? Well, first of all, you don't get 20 episodes. You know, right. we, we were doing 22. And then when we were doing both shows, we were doing 40. And now if you're lucky, you get six. Six, yeah. And then they'll fill it out to make a full season of 10, you know, for an order. Or, so, so the or order just a pilot. Come, I mean, they have to give you some lead time for production, right? I, they, they, they should, and, but they don't. They just try to throw more writers at the problem. And here's the other thing, Rick. When you, when you have... When you do 10 episodes of something, that's not even half a year. So you can't ask your crew, like with 22 episodes, they, the crew could you know, take off for two months, maybe do a movie or maybe take the time off right. and, and, and then come back and do it all again for 22 episodes. Because we always built in, as was part of your contract, thank you, a two week hiatus in the middle of every season. Oh, okay, you're welcome. You, yeah, thank you. No, that was that was something that the studio uh, would probably not would have uh, agreed to. But you said, "Why don't I just put it in my contract?" And we and we all went, "That's a really good idea, right?" <laughs> oh no, yeah, we can do it. 
Yeah, you bastard. I'm two so weeks glad. off. No, we got our two weeks off. It was and it yeah. was thanks to you. And that that actually I wrote most through most of them, but it was on a much lighter schedule. But my other That's favorite great. story from the beginning of Stargate, I tell this too. I don't know if you remember this, but it's a great Richard Dean Anderson story. <laughs> contractually, contractually, you your name, Richard Dean Anderson, had to be the same size as the title Stargate SG-1 in terms of the same font. Now, that's not something you requested, obviously. That was just something that your agents and lawyers stuck in. And, and, and so, and in fact, I know it's not something you requested because I remember you laughing your head off when I showed you the poster that couldn't fit Richard Dean Anderson anymore. It could only fit the word Hard Dean Anders. <laughs> Hard well, Dean Anders was all yeah. that fit. And you had the same reaction as you did just now. You went, I kind of like it. <laughs> Hard Dean Anders, let's go with that. <laughs> oh my God. I'm just now finding out about the font size. This is Oh no, no, no. Yeah, I remember you just laughed at that and said, Don't worry about it. Change it to whatever you need. It was pretty funny. Yeah, make it fit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was you exercise, not exercising your tremendous star power at the time. You just said, ah, <laughs> at least we yeah. can go with Hard Dean Anders. That would have been, that would have been different. <laughs> when you think about your career, do you, do you, I'm sure you jump back and forth because, because we all do, but what was harder being the lead of, uh, being the, you were younger, but you were, MacGyver was, was the, you were in every scene, right? Pretty much. Yeah. And and you've got some scenes off uh, occasionally in Stargate as we split things up a little bit. Yeah. But but you were running and around and shooting in both. So which which would you say was harder? Well, well, MacGyver was more difficult physically. I had more fun doing Stargate than I did doing uh, not that MacGyver wasn't fun, but uh, it certainly was arduous, um, in part because, and there's kind of a balance here because uh, because I was in virtually every scene, not literally, but you know, um, uh, but thankfully I was younger doing the MacGyver than because I was ready to kind of settle into something when uh, we all met. And right. I didn't know it initially, but the more it, you know, kind of uh, grew <clears throat> and we all got to know each other as actors and produce and, you know, as a family, yes. uh, it, become, it became just uh, so much fun for me because everybody, first of all, everybody was very bright and had uh, brought their own stuff and uh, personalities to their characters and we all got along and there was just kind of a, a lighter environment in which to work and um, and again it goes back to what the only demand I had was that you know let's let's not make this brain surgery or let's make this a happy brain surgery <laughs> <laughs> whatever <laughs> I like putting it that way. Let's make it a, an enjoyable brain. If we have to have brain surgery, let's make, let's enjoy ourselves. Make it, way. make it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Let's, it's, it's the way it's honestly, it's the only way to make TV. People seem to want to go out of their way to make it difficult, to set a fire so that they can put it out, you know, drives me nuts. Who does that? I mean, I we need names, but, um, or maybe we do need names. No, there, there, there have been there have been people in our path that uh, did do that. Uh, uh, I won't name names, but uh, uh, You'll sometimes send. they were in charge of letting us continue another season. So we had to uh, uh, we had to grin and take it sometimes. Okay, I didn't I didn't know those people. No, well, or when they were with you, it was it was uh, it was always pleasant. Yeah. yeah. It was <laughs> There were a few. I'm, there were a few knife fights, Rick. I had a. I had, had a few knife fights. Oh yeah, I was never so, or more aware of of the dynamic of, 
walking into the room and knowing that there had been tension, but then all of a sudden here comes the angel Anderson and um, let's be nice to him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just so, uh, yeah, whatever would it. No, it's important. It's important. You, you, uh, a little bit of uh, life-saving sometimes. My biggest image of you in the office is not walking into the into my office or, or or even being on set. It's laying on the floor with dogs. Oh yeah! Wow. Because there was always dogs in our studio because of John Smith and because you would bring yours and I would occasionally bring Boo, who yeah. I couldn't bring because my dog Boo was not meant to be in a place like that. She would just follow anyone out the elevator and run immediately to the food truck. And just say, well, <laughs> at least you knew where he was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was what she did. Yeah, yeah. Great, great times. I get to uh, be a, a, a grand puppy, granddaddy to a puppy. My daughter, my youngest daughter has a, has a uh, Bison Shih Tzu named Tango. And oh, it's cute. He, he is yeah. so cute. Oh, God. Yeah, and he, oh. He just loves me and I get on the floor. I get on the floor and Tango comes running and jumps on my head and just is so excited just because there's somebody on the floor, which well, I learned from you, I guess. Absolutely. And I've been that way my entire life. My dad and mom both um, confirmed this uh, independent of each other, um, that when I was a baby, literally a baby, and I'm sure I've told this story millions of times, but we lived in the uh, Quonset hut in uh, on the University of Minnesota campus, <clears throat> and um, we, they when I was still in uh, blankets, my mom would uh, put me out, uh, lay me on the ground um, under this big oak tree, and, uh, and you know, blankets, and you know, safely down there. Yeah, and the dogs from around the, the neighborhood would all gather um, around the blanket or under the tree somewhere nearby within like close proximity and just spend the afternoon in the shade, drinking the water and um, sniffing me. And I'm, you know, even though I had no cognizance, no awareness of what was going on, apparently some seed was sown and um, I just have always wanted to be on their level. And, and I know that it's easier for them to communicate or um, aren't as intimidated if you're way up above them and say, oh, yeah. cool. so yeah. it, it, I've just always done that. I've done it in the middle of the street, um, you know, dirt. It, it doesn't matter, but because I just love them. Um, yeah. Dogs are, I think, my absolute favorite animal of all, out of all the exotics that we could, you know, know and love. <clears throat> the domestic dog wins. Oh, I love them too. I love, and Tango's only this tall, so I have to get, you know, to, yeah, tiny little thing. And Tons a picture, of will you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I will. I was I will. saying I really like your background too. Oh yeah, well, that's that's my. There's Boo in the middle. That's uh, these are all the cats and dogs we've had, and and uh, and my mother painted that. That's Tango. I gotta get my this. This is double bright. My mother painted it. She's ninety, Rick, and she says hello. By the way, oh, she remembers that? fondly because she sat. My mom and dad sat on the set, and and she would often you would often sit beside her, and and she loved that. She loved you. Let me get the picture. I'll be right back. So my mom painted, this is a photo of the painting, but this is Tango when she was a puppy. He was a puppy. Tilted a little bit, there's glare. Okay, well, there you go. There. Oh. Yeah, that's Tango at about four months old. And, and uh, my mother, who's 90, painted that for my daughter. That's phenomenal. Yeah. That's yeah. really nice. Yeah, and she's, uh, she's really good. She's really good. It, is um is the pup going to get bigger than that oh yeah yeah okay. yeah that that's just you know that one of, that was just 
because she's 90, she wanted to, you know, paint it sooner rather than later. She's, uh, she's at that stage of her thinking. And because the coloring is really nice at that, at when they're younger, it fades a little bit. But uh, no, she, yeah. she loved it. It, oh, it was a wedding present. Very, very impressed with that. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah, she's, uh, she's good. She's really good. So I got the ability to, uh, to show you a picture of Tango and show off my mother's artwork at the same time. It's an oil painting. Well done. Keep it coming. I love that. Yeah. She Wait, just finished another one. She does commissions. That's an oil painting? Yeah. Well, it's a photograph of an oil painting. You're right. I don't have yeah. the original. Yeah. yeah the, real, the original's about yay by yay. It's really good. That's beautiful work. Beautiful work. My mom used to work in oils, uh, but nothing that, uh, what's the word? Naturalistic, realistic. Um, my mom would, uh, for lack of a better style, pointillism or um, impressionism, she would use little strokes and stuff. And um, she was very good at that. But that, what your mom has done is spectacular. Yeah. She's yeah. still doing it, right? Yeah. Yeah. She just finished one. She just finished. A, she loves doing dogs. She loves doing oh. same reason. She loves dogs and she loves capturing who they are in their eyes because it's always the eyes, right? Yep. When a dog looks at you, when they look at you with love, they and they're so emotional. Dogs exist almost entirely on emotion, as yep. you know that. And that's that's why she's so good at it, because she captures their eyes. That's that's what it's all about is in, in the eyes. That's how if I can tell when I meet a new dog, if uh, if we can go any further than the stranger meeting dog or strange dog meeting, you know, <laughs> right? uh, because it, it is in the eyes completely. Yeah. If there's any kind of pause at all um, to your to your gaze. Uh, in the dog's eyes, there's a chance that you're going to get a little more bonding than you would normally. Yeah. And if you're, if they assess that you're an asshole, then you don't stand a chance. That's true. So. That's true. But it's all how you approach them too. Like they, you would yeah. never, they would never think that of you because you know how to approach a dog. Yeah. But um, will you get another dog, please? You're not... <laughs> Come on, you're right. Debbie. I, 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 my, Debbie would like to get one. Well, give it some good consideration. Um, Andy's on her last legs, so to speak, but she, um, I'm in the same frame of mind as you are about. Well, I'm not sure if I am, but uh, mine is that I'm so old that I don't think I could do it justice. I couldn't. I don't know that I could get another Australian because they need activity. They need to work and run and play. And I don't do any of that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need a dog that can swim because that's, that's something yeah. that, that uh, well, does your Australian Shepherd still swim? She, she won't willingly go in the, in the pool. Oh, okay. she'll, she'll love to uh, be around it. She uh, trips a little bit now. She, her equilibrium's going, but I have these, these um, water gun type thing, or tubes that you just suck up and, yeah. well, she loves chasing that on the grass, so. But now she's to the point where she'll do maybe two or three and then just kind of walk away. We used to throw, we used to, you, you were at my last house, uh, we had that giant front yard, it was a hundred yard long front yard. And it, it, I'd come home from work after Stargate and I'd, I'd throw the Frisbee and she, when she was young, she would, run and catch it you know 10 feet off the ground and bring it back and yep. just keep doing it and that was her exercise and and uh toward the end she, i would throw it and she'd run and she'd pick it up and she'd look at me and she'd go just take it next time i bring it back just keep it for god's sakes <laughs> what is <laughs> i'm done bringing this damn thing back it's a piece of plastic Wait. what do you want we have not talked enough about uh, what I'm sure fans are, are wanting us to talk about, but we have this uh, this uh, thing, and we just we've been doing it on all these podcasts where fans submit questions, and, um, and 
it, and we get to hear what that question is, and then you answer. And they're all for you because you're uh, you're Richard Anderson, and uh, they would love to uh, they would love to hear them. So, do you mind if we uh, roll into some of those? I'd rather not, really. No, I'm kidding. Yes, of oh. course. <laughs> Jesus, hide your face, man. No, I, I, if you didn't, if you don't want to, that's fine too. But let's let's. It might be fun. Yeah, might I don't be. even know what they are. So so uh, so. Let's see. Okay. I reserve Tommy, the right. Are you, Tommy's got them lined up. Tommy's with a companion who's the host for these podcasts. Such a nice guy, a good boy. <laughs> They're all nice guys there. Hi, Mr. Anderson. My name is Sam, and it is so nice to virtually meet you. I grew up watching Stargate SG-1 with my dad for many, many years, and it got us through some really tough times in life. So just wanted to say thank you. Uh, my question is, what is the best piece of life advice you've received and why did it stick with you? Thank you. Best piece of life advice. First of all, thank you. Um, uh, best piece of life. That's a good question. It really is. It's already stumped me. Uh, <laughs> well, growing up in Minnesota, there's a general, or at least in my family, the Anderson family, my dad um, had the greatest influence on my behavior and my, um, my uh, curiosity, intellectual curiosity primarily. And his, his own, he, never in a single statement, just listen and assess um, before you react, which is not good for improvisation necessarily. But, um, but I think in life, the older I've gotten, the more I, uh, that I heed that, that advice. Because too many it's so much negative stuff can happen if you just don't hear what is actually being said or what um, what is being shown you. Um, look further. Basically, that's it. Just uh, listen to what's going on and um, and react accordingly. Uh, the assessment of what you hear and see and, and taste, touch um, is important to uh, to know. I mean, to keep in um, in front of you. So I don't know. There's take kind it of in. A, take it huh? in. No, I, I hear you. I think that's a great advice, not only in life but in uh, in business. Definitely in acting. I mean, I think in auditions. One of the biggest problem I, problems I have with actors is they're just waiting to say their next line. Yeah. Most of acting is, is listening to what's actually being said because acting is not only when you're speaking, it's, it's, it's the reacting. And if you don't listen, you're, you're not going to be able to perform properly either. Right? I think that's my, I discovered late because I was one of those people that would just wait for the next time I spoke early on uh, but it, it, things get so much more interesting if you well in acting let's say the if you see someone listening if yeah. that makes any sense because so much can go on behind the eyes and, uh, from within if you're actually listening and perceiving truth exactly that's 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 a good. great answer it's good what you said well, I mean, you're quoting your dad, but it applies to a lot of things. Yeah, absolutely. This Terry is for Richard Dean nice. Anderson and Brad Wright. Both you guys are absolutely amazing. Let me just say that. And the question is, what percentage of lines did Rick make up on the spot and improvise in the filming um, of Stargate? You had to bring that up. <laughs> Shit. Well, early on, I don't know now if if I've been forgiven, but early on, I was, a, I was a terrible, terrible um, oh, partner, acting guy <laughs> for Brad. 
in particular, and I found myself apologizing profusely to him once I realized that he was right in that I wasn't in read throughs. I wasn't being fair to the writers, to the producer, to well, to anyone, the actors, because I would indulge in that kind of response uh, or reactive response, which is tantamount to improvising or just taking something in a different direction. Um, I Brad knows this from receiving some um, recent texts from me that I'll, I can go off on a tangent in a split second, like in a breath, I'll be somewhere else. <clears throat> and that's what uh, I kind of lived with when I was early on during our, um, our uh, time together on Stargate. And I, Brad busted me. He just, he just said, he just laid it down, laid it out straight and honestly. And I was taken aback at first. And then because I get really defensive about that, because it's so much fun. But um, I said, basically, I think I said to myself, maybe not to you, but I said, you know, but that fucker is right. He's right. And I issued a, an apology, uh, apology to, to him and to um, a variety of, of other writers. But yeah, it wasn't. Uh, it just wasn't fair of me to be doing what, doing all that um, playtime, play stuff when we were there to work, get something done. That's not to say that it's not, you know, that it went out the window. That whole impulse because it shouldn't and it and it didn't and, but and it also shouldn't and i think we talk, talked about that too that doesn't mean that you know it needs to be letter perfect ever um no and and it was a it was actually it was a good conversation to have when we had it because i was just afraid of it getting out of control <clears throat> with everybody and it you know well it did for a while i mean not yeah. out of control but everybody was starting to do it and I, at that point, in retrospect, at th that point when they were all trying to um, jump on the bandwagon, um, that it, it was really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> when you were on the receiving end of somebody else changing the lines. It, yeah. That, I said, yeah. I, is that what it's like to work with me? And I, I, I don't want to work with me. Um, so, yeah, and I don't know how that all calmed down because I couldn't tell them to stop it because I was guilty myself. But, I well, we got... One of the things we did was we stopped having read-throughs. Yes. <laughs> that helped. That might have been, that might have been the... Uh... I think I said, I think that was the, that was the conversation began with, I've had enough of that shit. We're not going to, I'm not going to willingly submit myself to it. Uh, if you want to do it on the stage and you start realizing that'll lead to overtime, that might be the best cure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, well played. Uh, hell, I was making it up as I was going along too. I was, I was, uh, I, I was uh, a fairly young showrunner. So uh, it was, uh, you know, a bit of a struggle for me too. I remember one line, two lines, that one is the reason I think you, or at least you told me, was the kind of line that is why you wanted to do the show and, and, and wanted more of. And that was a line that I put, I wrote in the pilot when, when you say to Tilk after he breaks you out, come on, and he says, I have nowhere to go. And you say, for this, you can stay at my place. And you love that line. And, and I realized, okay, I need to figure out how to do more of those. And it took time. But then I also realized, and I, and I don't really, I don't think it's a fault and, and, it, and, it, and it makes it very forgivable. And I think part of it is I would write a joke or someone would write a joke and you would go, this is funny, but it's not me. And so you would, Put, put a, a joke in there, it would just be a different joke. It would be a, you know, another joke. And serving the scene, it, it just would be a different, it would be your way of delivering the humor. And I really never objected to that. Well, that was always what I was afraid of 
doing ultimately was um, um, of not serving the scene or not serving yeah. the 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 entire uh, well, I don't want to say the the franchise. I don't think we're going to go down with one joke, but. But if it yeah. still serves the scene, I never really objected to that. Although I do, on a couple of occasions, remember coming to you and saying, "You know, the written joke might be funny," and you would and you would try it, and I go, "No, nope, you're right. Do it your way," <laughs> because you needed it. You needed to do it your way. It's just who you are, and you know, at the end of the day, that's that. It worked. I mean, I kept coming. You, I kept asking you to come back and play long after Stargate SG-1 was over. So obviously, you know, there was love and respect there. Well, just know that I'm, I, it, I'm embarrassed by some of my behavior during that, it, that time. And um, uh, I just hope you can forgive me. Of course. And occasionally, occasionally I would write a line uh, that, that uh, everyone, th I'd like to give you a good example. Uh, Everybody in the world thinks this is a, there was, remember the ice cave episode, Martin Wood's second episode, we, Carter and, and O'Neill are frozen in an ice cave. Yeah. And I wrote a line that everyone in the world thinks was an ad lib, but it's a scripted line. It's my sidearm, I swear. Do you remember that line? Yes, of course. Yeah, that was a scripted line. And I know, I know it was a scripted line because I had to fight with the Air Force to, to keep it in because they were saying, is this an insinuation that he's aroused? No, it's his sidearm. What are you talking about? What are you, get your heads out of the gutter, guys. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Did you really do that? Say that yes. To them? Yes, I had to fight for that line because the Air Force was not happy about it. Could they, I mean, ultimately, let's, could they actually stop us from using it? Oh, they, they actually, they, they could, well, they couldn't have stopped us, but remember they were giving, doing a lot of favors for us. They were letting us fly with F-16s. They were giving us planes. They were, they were letting us wear the Air Force insignia and not pretending to be Air Force. We were actually portraying Air Force officers. There was a, remember the, the time, and I think it was season one or two, where we wrote a scene where you kissed Carter in an alternate reality. In an alternate reality, you were together. <clears throat> and they said, absolutely not. And we sat there and we, I remember Robert Cooper and I sitting there going, oh, geez, we, it's a great beat in the scene. And I think Robert, who wrote, did, rewrote the episode, if not wrote it, I can't remember, <clears throat> said, uh, what if it's Dr. Carter? And they went, oh, that's fine. <laughs> so you got to do the kiss because it was Dr. Carter, not Major Carter or Captain Carter. I knew you had battles with them. I didn't know that they had any kind of, they wielded any um, power. They could have pulled their support entirely. Yeah. So in order to get that support, we had to bend a little sometimes. But I mean, that was an easy bend. You just had to find a way around it. Yeah. And what she was a doctor, right? She was Dr. Captain Samantha Carter. So for that for that episode, at least she. Yeah. No, no, it, because it was an alternate reality. She was she was not in the military. She was just Doctor Carter in that one. Perfect. Yeah, you guys are geniuses. Well, Ron's yeah. a pretty smart guy. I'm pretty sure that was his solution. Brilliant. Says something about the Air Force too. By the way. <laughs> hey, didn't they make you an honorary general or colonel or something? Yes, yes. In fact. Um, uh, General Jumper, remember him? I remember him, yeah. When he came on, in fact, that's one of the, um, that's something I, I remember distinctly about him was that he was on, he, we used him as an extra or um, to portray himself, actually, I guess, in um, a couple of scenes. Nicest guy, I've, you know, I've ever met in the Air Force. Well, those guys but, are, at that level are politicians. They, they're very good at dealing with people. yeah well that yeah i flew to do uh, to washington for that um yeah. to receive that which was really a phenomenal honor i have to say yeah uh, i was pretty humbled by it all <clears throat> but while he was on set we um i got to chatting him up a little bit about 
about characters in the Air Force and um, and specifically was I was there anything credible about my portrayal of Jack O'Neill and um, and like do you have uh, do you do you have so airmen like um, that are like that and he interrupted me and said yes and worse <laughs> and I was, oh, well thank god he said keep doing it you're right on and I went, oh, good. yeah That's should fun. i worry i remember another another fun experience you got to have that wasn't through the air force it was through the navy remember went down in continuum you got to go to the arctic and beyond a nuclear submarine. Yeah. And one of my favorite moments in dailies was, because I didn't get to go, but because uh, my, <laughs> long story, my plane couldn't land and then they lost my luggage and then I had to fly back. Uh, that's why I never made it to the Arctic. But anyway, um, uh, the, uh, Martin Wood, the director of Continuum, that movie we did, uh, got the captain to say action and cut. <laughs> Uh, and no. I remember watching dailies and you were like, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> it was the yeah. captain of the actual submarine. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. that. Yeah, uh, he was cool. Kind of cramped, cramped uh, situation down there. But Well, for tall guys like you, yeah. Yeah, what an honor though. I mean, and literally they brought that submarine up through the ice for us. And yeah. it, it meant, uh, you knew this, right? That it took so much underwater, uh, under ice finagling with that ship, the sub, um, to get to hit a mark. Yeah. And they hit it within, uh, I'd say a foot and a half that, that came right straight up in through that ice. And I was just God. Well, I remember asking. I remember I said, oh, "God, I hope I hope they they have to react in character because they're only going to be able to do this once." <laughs> <laughs> I remember I remember asking the question of Barry. I remember saying, that, "So, so can they surface the sub? Because that would be great for the movie. Can I, can we shoot in the sub? Because that would be great for the movie." I just kept asking for more and more and more, and then and they came through. It was amazing. Yeah, were they happy about all that? I they mean, do it. they? I wonder if they must like the company. <laughs> they loved it. They absolutely loved it. They they loved the uh, they loved everything about it because um, yeah the company certainly yeah but but also you know when we make them when we make them look like real people when 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 we write Air Force or Navy characters that are humans it it, it takes away the you know the the uh, the illusion of, of you know this faceless warrior that's off fighting battles. They're people. They're part of. They're, they're citizens, just like just like everybody yeah. else. And a lot of them are kids. Very young. Yeah. Yeah. Notice. And then Remember, when, the, when the when I asked the captain, or you asked the captain, why do you repeat the order for dive so many times? Uh, and and uh, because it's like every order is given three times before the diving office. The the the. the the kid steering the thing actually performs the the, right. uh, the, the maneuver, and the, and the and the captain or the XO said uh, <clears throat> because the kid driving this billion dollar submarine was in high school six months ago. That's why we repeat <laughs> it. Every, <laughs> it's true. It's true. Stands to reason. I swear. Oh yeah. my god. Tommy, hit us with another one. Hi, this is Marsha. So Hi, come Mar and step into the way back machine, back to when you were in the Daily Soap Opera General Hospital. Oh. Back then, is that where you first got your first taste of being a heartthrob? What was that like? Or I didn't acknowledge that particular reality um, for many years because <clears throat> of it, again part of it's a minnesota thing but also uh specifically or in particular the uh my family yeah, the anderson group um 
we're it, it, my mom actually said you know, my mom or dad uh one of my parents said that uh you're really in the wrong business for your personality and i said well what do you mean specifically and he said well there's a certain humility that we all kind of breed and um you're getting a lot of attention and um and i i said well yeah i guess from that point i realized that there was an aspect of being an on-camera um worker bee that that brings uh you know, that brings the notoriety and the familiarity and um, stardom. I, I hate that word, but um, I, I don't know. I just, I'm, as you can tell, I'm having a hard time answering the question because it deals with humility. And I want to give you a serious answer to some degree, but it's, it's like your, your life sort of has to go on as your own self and my own self uh, was was not uh, yearning for attention or um or stardom or any of that it was i i got into the business because i liked acting i you know it was really fun for me and my parents are both were, were both um artists artisans my dad a musician my mom all kinds of art oils and sculpting but I couldn't do any of that and I hadn't discovered writing at all and I still struggle with it but acting was something that I could do um well yeah we call it acting I guess but it was there's a certain energy about uh, that environment and that particular job that I was comfortable doing and exploring and um and again it comes down to the the fun factor um i can't say that it was always fun to be is it brad is it the word uh, idolize is it are you an idol when you're like you as an actor always needed to be grounded you always needed to have a sense of this feels comfortable coming out of my mouth so when you were ever asked to do something that had techno babble or felt disingenuous coming out of mm. you, you pushed it away. It had to feel real coming from you. Is that, is that fair to say? That's, that's fair to a point um, because part of the reason that techno babble didn't work with me is because I couldn't remember it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Technobabble aside, even a joke, back to what I said earlier, You're it, right. it, it had, had to feel genuine. It had, more for you as an actor, it has to feel genuine. Otherwise you feel silly. And I've actually, yeah. you, you say, I feel silly doing this. I've, felt, I've heard you say that. And, and it sometimes was a very easy fix. It was just to make it feel real to you. And I yeah. think that's what, that's what comes across. And I think that's, if I may, part of the stardom, because part of that X factor is people love watching people who are genuine. And, and you innately know and feel, I'm not, if I do this, if I try to do this, it won't be genuine. And I, yeah. and it, and it, it won't feel real to me. And it, so is that, a, is that true? I love that. Um, that, that does me good and, and, justice i think um yeah, yeah I, I think since the 60s i've always been uh I, I, the the word phony had always been yeah. um kind of in the lexicon that i grew up with part of that came from jd salinger of course through uh holden caulfield and um which had a great impact on me um uh, literary wise <clears throat> But um, yeah, I think you you've done me well with the with the comment. Yeah. So so that's you know that's how you respond to the other stuff too. I think it's not you. Yeah, 
I, you know what, I think I, I've also, um, well, in a cruel term, um, ridiculed such uh, figures in, in, well, show business for sure, but in life in general, it was always easy to just um, make fun of the person so full of himself that, yeah. you know. Yeah, he never wanted to be that guy. I didn't want to be that guy. I love talking to you. First of all, you're the only intellectual stimulation I've gotten in a year and a half. So thank <laughs> you. This has really been fun. It has. It has. And and I and I loved reconnecting with you too. And and uh, and you look great, by the way. Really? Yeah. 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 It's a it's a look. It's a look. <laughs> I, I and love... uh, and I appreciate uh, I appreciate you taking the time. And I think. Uh, I think the fans are going to love it. We'll, we'll chat again. Yeah, we'll call this Volume 1.